All right. Well, I'm going to push things into the third round here. Now, I know this is a super flex league. We got two quarterbacks left to at least have some buzz to potentially go in the end of the first round. So I'm going to go ahead and take the first one because this is the biggest differentiate we have between the ADP and where we're taking him. His ADP is at the 201. I'm taking him here at the 301. It's going to be Bo Nix, quarterback from Oregon. Is a guy who could slide into the end of the first round, in which case I think 301 won't even be an option for you. I think 201, people are going to push him up there, and then that's a completely different conversation. But even if he falls to day two, if he's a second-round pick, I feel cool taking a quarterback just in general. I'm, I'm not a quarterback scout per se, but – you know, I feel comfortable taking if you're going to go with like Will Levis last year, if I'm going to get him at the 301, it's worth the shot. Um, Mike, I'm, I'm going to throw this over to you here, and I just want to hear your general thoughts on Bo Nix and where do you think he should be going if he does end up going at the end of the first round? If he goes in the end of the first round for NFL draft, I think he has to be probably an early second round pick in your rookie draft. You can't ignore that. This kind of value ins insulation there, and if you really don't like him, I'm sure you could – You'll, you'll see some like preseason buzz. I don't even need to wait to see him hit the field. Just wait for the preseason buzz and ship him off for a future pick uh, that you would probably prefer. Um, as far as like the actual player himself goes, a lot of his nickname and bubble scheme, bubble screen bow. He's got like really low, just a system QB, but he ran that system so well. Um, so even though I don't really believe in the talent, I do believe in QBs that can run a system, have a place in NFL long term, usually more as a backup. Um, and they can work out like like Jared Goff. He's a system QB. Like Kirk Cousins is kind of a system QB. Uh, Tom Brady was well, kind of made his own system. He was the system. But again, system QBs have some long term to them. Um, but I, I do think Bo Nix is most likely, and I think most probably, a long term career backup like Journeyman and maybe some spot starts. But even even if like let's say he doesn't go to the first, just with that description, still a fine pick in the third round. The yeah. lowest IAY or A dot, however you want to call it, um, of any of like the top quarterbacks, like he had a 7.1 IAY intended air yard. So, how far he was throwing it down the field, um, compared to you know, we we're talking about like Drake May was at 10.7, Caleb Williams 9.45, Jaden Daniels 9.35, JJ McCarthy over 10, you know, and then you have seven. It's he's he's uh, what would you call him, Mike? Bubble screen bow. <laughs> Bubble uh, screen bow. That's that's that is a great that's a great call. <laughs> Over sixty percent of his passing yards came off of yak ability from his receivers. Okay, here we go. All right, John, uh, we got you here at the three o two. All right, so this is my boy. Uh, I, I can't believe I'm drafting him here at the 302. But unfortunately, when you run a 472 with Audric Estime, you know you're you're gonna fall in in the in the rookie drafts, especially. Uh, I think it's gonna be a mistake. Uh, his production showed that he is a quality running back, and he actually has the third highest burst score in the class. So yes, his high end speed, his top end speed, is not there, but. I'm not a film watcher. I'm not a film grinder. I could I can almost guarantee you that Corey and Mike could have told you that before the combine that he didn't have top end speed, but yet he's breaking these tackles. He's getting away from defenders, and guess what? Because he has the third highest burst score in the in the draft. So yes, I actually did drop him a couple spots in my in in my uh, ranks when it was all said and done because of the combine. But I'm not going to completely just murder him like a lot of people are. And so I don't want people to forget about Audra Gestime. If you can get him at 302, I honestly feel like it's going to be a steal when it's all said and done. He literally has the best production profile of any running back in this class. He just doesn't quite have the athleticism, obviously, running a 472. Um, so you, you add that up, and he ends up being... I want to say it was my RB5 when it was all said and done. Yeah, I mean, what's up with these Notre Dame running backs just coming in and the athletic testings aren't quite there. I will say the burst is one good thing, at least to hang your head on. But I do want to I want to do want to put it over someone who's watching this guy play and breaking down kind of his film there because he was a hot name. You are right, John, before the combine and people shouldn't have been surprised that he didn't run a you know four four, but maybe they just weren't expecting four seven two. Mike, how do you feel about Audrey Estime and did the combine uh, teach you anything new or did it just kind of confirm what you were already thinking? There's a little bit of confirmation, but I really didn't think he was going to come in at a four, two, a uh, four, seven, sorry, a four, seven. Um, Cause me and Corey were talking about like 40 times and we're like, there's no way he's slower than Roshan Johnson. Right. 
and uh, he came in slower than Roshan Johnson. So mm -hmm. uh, we, we already kind of like through film think that he has a very slow first step. He's a build up speed runner. So he does have that top gear. Like it's definitely there. And like, let's say they changed the 40 to a 60 yard dash. He would have crushed it. If it was a 60 yard dash. Um, so he does have that top gear there and there's not a lot of like straight line power backs in this class. So he has like a defined skill set. Um, yeah. I do think it's funny though. In the sheet, you put the projected draft capital third to six, like just say NFL draft at that point. <laughs> <laughs> Every yeah. running back in this draft. <laughs> oh, <laughs> yeah. yeah that, that's, <laughs> that's pretty much like, you're not, you're, you're not the top guy. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. Well, we're at this point in where the mock draft database is where it's kind of all over the place, right? With running backs. Uh, once you get past the top, I mean, you're going to see all these mocks putting, trying to fit them in into the third round, and that just doesn't happen. I think we saw that last year. People were seemingly shocked when half of the running backs that everyone thought was going to be day two, because everyone wants to see that day two draft capital. They didn't end up getting that day two draft capital. They end up falling around four, five, six, mm -hmm. and I. It, so that's kind of where it's looking like it's going to fall for Estime here. Either he, a, a team loved him in their process, and maybe maybe he sneaks in around three, but it's more or less looking like he's just going to fall to a team uh, middle to end of maybe day three. So I, I would agree with you. Just say he's going to get drafted, which is important for running backs here. We do want them to get drafted. So I, I, I will say that for him. But all right. So, Corey, we got you on the clock. 303. What are we doing? All right, 303, I'm going back to the wide receiver well once again, and I am taking Mr. Malachi Corley out of Western Kentucky. He's been a guy who uh, NFL evaluators seem to love. He's, you know, he's seen a lot of the rise through the, the offseason. He's seen a, a lot of people talk about him even through the season. And if you're looking for possibly the best yak guy in this class, it's possibly Malachi Corley. I mean, the way he can bounce off tackles, has a nice thick frame. Um, you know, people have given him the Debo comps, but the one area where he doesn't, line up with Debo is his downfield prowess. I mean, he didn't get many targets downfield. I mean, I think you guys even talked about it a, lit at, a bit at the uh, Senior Bowl that he wasn't excelling a little as much down the field as well. And that's a part of his game that you're going to kind of have to, you know, convince yourself of. It, can he build in those areas as well? And the fact that he goes, he went to Western Kentucky. I mean, we're talking about a G5 school playing G5 competition most of the time. That takes a ding for me in my profile. But we're coming here to the third round, talking about a guy who has a skill set that makes it to the NFL, that he can become this easy target for a a new quarterback for a quarterback who just wants to dump the ball off and a guy who can create on his own. That's Malachi Corley. And that's a guy who I think can get on the field early enough and supply a little bit of value at the dynasty level, hopefully, and hopefully continue to build the other parts of this game. So three or three Malachi Corley. There you go. I, I, I do like you bringing up the Debo, just at least I put on a, I put up on Twitter a little bit of a meme that the flex tape, I'll post it over the screen for people listening where it was the, the, the water breaking through the tank. And I put mediocre college production, tweener size runs hard, not a good wide receiver, but not a running back, smaller program product. <laughs> and then when he slaps the tape on there, I just put the next Debo Samuel. I'm not That's necessarily right. uh, Malachi Corley here, but I do think that there are a couple guys, uh, you know, every year is at least one guy who's brought up, whether it's Lynn Bowden Jr., whether it's, uh, yes. you know, uh, LaVisca Chenault. Uh, mm -hmm. There are a couple, I'm drawing a blank, but there were a couple guys last year, even like, even like a Wandell Robinson, mm -hmm. um, you know, people, a uh, Rondell Moore. Like when there's these guys that don't really have that defining trait, we do like to say that Debo, it is a good little joke there. But um, John, I I'll throw it over to you. Is there anything about Malachi Corey when you put him in? You know, about that stands out to you. Is there anything you think you can hang your hat on? Anything that makes him a differentiator? Or do you think he's just kind of next in line of 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 noise? Uh, yeah. Unfortunately, I feel like he's kind of next in line for noise. Uh, I just so you guys know, next year it's going to be Luther Burden, and he's going to be comp to Debo Samuel, and then you're gonna, you know, just know you you can already be out on on Luther Burden uh, for 2025 the draft class but yeah with uh with malachi corley it you know small school program uh not overly you know athletic or anything uh his he didn't show much as far as you know like the metrics the only thing is i stood next to him on the senior bowl field and he is a man like that dude is built you know so like that's the only thing we can truly say but if being built was an NFL trait, uh, you know, I feel like there'd be a lot more NFL, like high quality NFL players. And so unfortunately for Malachi, I'm going to be all out here. Uh, but at, at the same time, I will never like give people crap for third, fourth and fifth round picks and rookie drafts just because 
we're all kind of throwing darts. I mean, I have guys that I'm that I feel better about than Malachi Corley, but I cannot say with like confidence that like Malachi Corley is a bust or anything like that either. Now, Mike, if he does get this, we have here projected round three, four. If he does kind of sneak in either back in a day two or early on day three, uh, where will you fall, Mike? I kind of be the tiebreaker here between these two. I think Corey took him in the perfect spot where I would take him. He's honestly the last wide receiver I care about in this class, not to spoil the rest of my draft. I'm going to touch another one. Um, he has like a trump card trait and skill set. And so, like, he has to find you so he can offer an NFL team a skill set they don't really have. Um, so, I, I like this pick. I really do. I think third round sounds about right, like NFL draft and your rookie drafts. Um, and, you know, like, it, best possible case scenario they use them the way the chiefs use like rasheed rice and just these short area manufactured touches that's like absolute best case scenario but that's that would be ideal for him so i i like the pick from Corey and the analysis was spot they got a value based on adp adp on him uh going into the combine was 301 so that's kind of where he falls so you're getting him at three or three now mike you did say he's got tr trump card skill set can you just quickly define maybe one part of that skill set that you do think it really stands out Oh, just the yak stuff. I think he's really good short, like the short area. His in-breaking routes are really well done too. And Corey pointed out that he's just the senior bowl, like ball tracking, body adjustments, his hands too. I thought on tape he was like a defined body catcher. And he likes to do like the Garrett Wilson like hop for no reason when he catches the ball with his body. Like he purposely puts it in a place to catch it in his body. It's kind of weird. Like it's, But I, I did not see that at all the senior bowl actually so i don't know if he's working on that or that's just a quarterback thing but anyway um as far as like trump card trans talking about like his yak ability not every team has their like yak guy that's just you know the yak god there's like a handful of teams that have that like debo um and the chiefs have rasheed rice as their yak guy so i, I think corley can offer that to an nfl team awesome i will also put up on screen a little me because it reminded me of i put up with the Debo meme, I put up with Tyree Kill, uh, the Bernie Sanders meme, where he's saying, I, I'm once again asking uh, for us to remember that Tyree Kill is much more than a 40 time. I just want to put that out there as well. Because with the combine, people getting really hyped on these low fours, you know, four, two, four, three times. You're like, oh, this guy could be used like Tyree Kill. And for at that time of year, I do just want to pump the brakes there as well. He is way more talented than a 40 time. But I digress. Mike, push us on. We're making good progress. What's the 304? Yeah, I took uh, Michael Penix Jr., quarterback from Washington, um, six-year player. He's down two ACOs, not nearly as mobile as he was as a young kid. Um, just a pocket passer, which is kind of a dying um, position, like the pocket passers. It's mobility now. Uh, so he's going to go need to go to a team with a solid O-line. Uh, I would hate if this happens, but, for example, like the Patriots, nah, their O-line's not that solid anymore. But the old-school Patriots for the robust O-line – I think Michael Penix would fit well with a team like that. Uh, I think I view him as a short-term starter. I don't think he's going to go in the first or second, but I think like a team that misses out on quarterbacks in free agency and they miss out like the quarterbacks in the first round. I think they look to grab Michael Penix sometime in the third and they view him as a short round starter. And he's like serviceable, not ideal, but like serviceable. So I get him at the three here and any quarterback that I think even touches the field, their value goes up from third round capital. So I can probably capitalize on flipping him if I truly don't believe in his future. I can probably get like a, you know, mid to late second. Yeah, it's it's always hard to argue against quarterbacks in the third round. Just kind of especially a guy who could go in the first round, even if he ends up going round two, which is I think is if he doesn't make it to the back end, that's probably where he's gonna go. Uh, it's it's always I'm never gonna give you a hard time on the bet for quarterback at this point in the draft. Uh, again, we're behind the ADP here as well. I think it's just because we don't believe he's going to be a first round pick in the draft. Um, John, would you agree with the Paddock's evaluation just saying if he were to land in the correct spot that th this is a guy who could have a, a role at the next level and could could be uh, productive if, you know, if protected and does have the weapons necessary? I think he's a career backup. So, you know, if he has a great line and great offense and everything, he could be that Trent Dilfer or that Brad Johnson or, you know, whoever you want him to be. But, I mean, he's a literal career backup. Uh, so, you know, it, it, you know, we saw so many backups hit the field last year. I'm not saying that Penix doesn't have value. I have no issues with him being drafted here at 304. I always had issues when people were drafting me, like, the first rounds, like, early in the offseason. What are we doing here? 
304, perfectly fine with it. Uh, we've seen so many backup players be valuable and even get you know get more value because of you know jumping on the field. You draft them at 304. Next thing you know, you trade them for 204 or whatever the next year. And so uh, I don't mind the pick, but I do not think that, like he's an actual quality uh, NFL quarterback. I would comp him to like a a, a um, Kenny Pickett. You know, something to that effect. You know, like uh, just like nor or, or generalizing their uh, Davis their actual Mills kind of a career arc that I think about. Yeah, yeah. I'm just like saying. Oh, I was just looking at like the six year player that you know, like that kind of gets draft capital and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, but I, yeah, I, I think it's a career backup when it's all said and done. Yeah, seems like it's a a draft and flip kind of kind of plan here for Michael Penix Jr. Um, but we're gonna move into the 305 again with Alfred not being here. I just got to kind of take his guys, and I'm gonna go for the running back. I'm gonna take Will Shipley here, who he took at the I think it was 28 or 209 in a. Uh, the last draft we did two and nine in the, in the, in the last draft that we did here, uh, Will Shipley is kind of one of these backs in this class that I feel like I keep routinely seeing in these mock drafts, kind of sliding into the back end of day two potentially, but then he's not quite getting the same buzz in, you know, internet circles. He, he wasn't at the combine or didn't test at the, at the combine. Um, but he's a player who had give or take a thousand scrimmage yards, is three years at Clemson. He has a little bit of a receiving profile to him. So, Corey, I'm just going to ask you uh, with Will Shipley, is this a player that you have interest in? Is this a player that you think has what it takes to step up and have a role at the next level? And how would you feel if you were to take Will Shipley in the mid-third like I have here? Yeah, I think you hit it on the head when you said it a little bit earlier that you can't really question any pick in the third round. And, you know, take here, especially here, taking your stabs at the running backs. I don't really like the value of them taking them too much higher than the third this year, except for like those guys that are kind of like more in that top tier. So I like kind of taking your swings at guy here, guys here. And Will Shipley is a very like well rounded running back. Like I think he's got very solid athleticism. I think he's got good hands and I think he's a fine runner. The thing is, you know, when you're talking about guys like this, is how can they differentiate themselves at the next level? I'm not sure if he has that separating trait for himself to me he kind of lines up as a guy who's going to be like a change of pace guy like can he even break like a you know like a 30 percent workload or something like that at the next level like that i'm not so sure about but i think he's more he's well-rounded enough to be a guy who sticks around on an nfl roster and can contribute you know i just i wonder how much for fantasy we're going to be starting him without an injury in front of him mike do you have similar thoughts uh, yeah, I, I think he's a pretty good pass catcher at the next level. I don't know what he offers on the ground. My usual draft strategy um, for rookie drafts is like these like day three running backs. I'll probably ignore them and I'll look at like which one lands at a spot with opportunity. You know, that's how you end up with the, like your Tyler Algier who had a thousand yards that one year. And um, Elijah Mitchell was pretty pumped up there for that one year. So uh, if Will Shippey lands in the right spot, I love this pick. If he lands like in a super, like, lands with the Patriots, like I'm probably not going to touch him. <laughs> you know, so um, I, it's all about landing spot for me for these later running backs. Okay, there you go. Well, John, keep us pushing here. Who are you going to take at the three oh six? All right, so I'm I'm gonna go go ahead and take a guy that's completely fallen off the face of the planet because of his combine. Uh, people are absolutely gonna hate this pick, but I I can't get over it. like once again the combine is important to a certain ex a certain point but it's not the end all be all but bucky irving was a stud in college he produced uh, over multiple high end uh, prospects he still was the the main running back in that backfield um there was concerns going into this off season this past off season about can he actually run up the middle and this year he showed he can still run up the middle like he can he can do it all he's he's technically a three three down back he just doesn't have that three down back size and so like people are going to freak out about his, his speed his 40 time and all that at the size that he came in at which is 192 pounds and i believe what five nine i think it was um i i mean it's it's yeah it, it's not ideal but when you combine it with the production profile, I still love Bucky. And at 306, you give me that kind of production with, uh, you know, with the possibility of still, uh, we're still seeing like fourth round draft capital as a projection. Um, 
and obviously it could change between now and, and, and the actual draft and everything, obviously. But from what I've seen, I've already seen some pretty major changes from the combine. Marshawn Lloyd jumped up 30 spots. Um, uh, there was another player that jumped up like 20 or 30 spots as well. So we're seeing pretty major changes and yet we're not seeing that major change for Bucky. And I think it's because how can you argue with the production they actually put on the field? So I'm going to go ahead and take him here. He's a, a quality receiving back. He's probably the best re actual receiving back in the, the class. Um, so maybe he ends up just being a third down back or whatever you want to call him. But I believe he has a lot more to his game than just that. And obviously, if he gets that opportunity, then he could become that player. So, there, yeah, there's definitely question marks with Bucky Irving, especially after the combine. But I'm not going to write him off my board because he ran a 4-5-5. Five, five. It's not going to happen. Yeah, Bucky Irving was uh, one of these players where, again, we don't have Alfred here to defend. He took him at the 206 in the last draft. His ADP before the combine was 210. So getting him at the 306 is obviously one of those guys who's the biggest fallers because of that combine. I will be curious if he goes out on a pro day and runs a little bit better of a time. If you recall a year ago, slightly different type of player, but Atajay Spears was a guy who was all over the place in terms of people's draft boards. And then I, I believe it was his pro day went out and had his own times and and then he came back he got end up getting that draft capital that i don't think people were expecting him to get which maybe is what happens here with with bucky irving uh mike have you moved off of bucky irving because of the combine or are you just sticking with your guns on what you thought about the player prior i wasn't a fan prior uh so um but i did comp him to kenny canewell so i, I actually thought last last time we did this i thought mid second was about right but yeah actually, anyway yes i'm moving off of him uh you can be small in the NFL now that's kind of a, an ongoing trend like size matters much less i just think that you can't come in undersized and unathletic um so yeah i i i thought he was a passing back in the next level and now it's like i it's i don't know where i don't know what he does next level anymore so it, yeah i'm off yeah it's really tough with because you see obviously the smaller guys who have succeeded uh, recently uh, have that speed, right? I mean, James Cook to some extent, um, Devon Achan, right? Guys, they have the speed, and Bucky Irwin showed he didn't have that. But then, you know, not the same type of player, but even a Kyron Williams who was smart didn't have the speed. It showed us, okay, in, in, the, in, the right, in the right situation, there's still a role for that type of player. And Tajay Spears wasn't even a burner as well. And I think he impressed people kind of in that, in that first year as well. Uh, Corey, are you, are you Matt lined up with, with, with John on this one more with Mike on this one, we're going to use you as the tiebreaker and then we can push into your pick here at the three Oh seven. Yeah, I definitely can't, you, you can't really hop off something you were never on. And me and Mike have kind of shared that, that uh, feeling for Bucky Irving pretty early. Mike shares my feelings for this player. And I was Mike, why don't you uh, take this one for me? Yeah, you got it. So Corey at the 307 takes Devontae's walk here. We were pretty fans of him uh, coming in. He's got like legit speed, clocked at 23.2 miles an hour. Uh, has a very colorful like history. So in case you don't know, out of high school, um, training on his own, tore his ACL before he even enrolled in college. Just decided to not go to college for his whole first year out of high school. Second year, he goes to NC Central, like local JUCO school. Um, it's 2020. So like COVID shut down all of these small school leagues. So again, didn't he play this time? Wasn't his fault. And at 21, he transferred up to Kent state kind of like didn't do much. And then 2022 is when he took off. So a very fun history, but again, a guy that has a legit speed. We were pretty excited about him. Show some nice hands. Uh, we thought he could be used as like not only a field stretcher, but a nice like wide receiver two, three for NFL offense. Goes to the senior bowl and he just can't separate. DBs get into his frame very easily. They jam him easily. Um, even holding one arm back so that we they like these perfectly thrown balls from quarterbacks. Like he can't reel in one handed grabs either. So hands didn't look like an issue. And then all of a sudden the senior bowl it looked like a major issue. So uh, Corey's back though. So Corey, I kind of see a background in front of him and talk about the senior bowl. No, I, I think you nailed a lot of it on there. I think the thing you're th seeing with Devontae Walker is, um, you know, he was projected even as a first round pick by Daniel Jeremiah in his first mock draft. That kind of sent everything like sky high with him, everybody looking into him a little bit. But I think, you know, the thing that that's brought into my brought into more questions to me is more like the senior bowl 
questioning some of the hand saying even in the game, you know, struggling to bring in the ball a little bit more consistently than I expected him to be. So now I'm kind of picturing him as, as you know, maybe a lower end Christian Watson of this class, a guy who's fairly athletic, can be used in a lot of similar ways, but struggles a little bit at the catch point um, with ball tracking and stuff. Like that. And that was a lot of the similar stuff I saw with Christian Watson and that we saw in the NFL in year one with him as well. You know, even the first pass he got in the NFL was a deep shot that he just couldn't track and completely missed off of, uh, I think it was from Aaron Rodgers in his first year with Christian Watson. So I think there's a lot of things that line up there, especially from the athletic standpoint. Um, and I feel like he's a little, he can still be a little bit of value here because I think people are so off of him from the way that senior bowl went that I, and I'm looking at big boards. He's still ranked as a top, as a, as a day two prospect, you know, more, probably more close to like your third round. So I'm liking taking him here. Cause I think that like, I'm like I said before, you're betting on some traits here and he's got a lot of them. Could it be Taekwon Thornton? Could it be Denzel Mims? That's very much still in the, his realm of possibility. There's risk here as well, but at three Oh seven, I mean, you take your shot and you hope for the best. If you had to define his, his play style, what, what, what would you put it as? Cause we know he's got that four, three, six speed. He showed he was 90th percentile speed score, 98th in his burst score. So this guy's fast, but how does it, what does he play? What kind of receiver is he? He is a vertical role. Like if you would think about the way DJ Chark is used, I think that's the way that you could picture Devontae Walker being used. A vertical threat, not a guy who's going to run a lot of in-breaking routes and a lot of like fast feet or whatever. Uh, Jamison Williams might just put in the chat. That's another similar type of like architect I could see him working. But I do think he offers, he could offer a little bit more as well. So um, it depends on how much he refines himself at the next level. But right now, yeah, very raw, vertical, linear player, I would say right now. Okay. Well, when we did this um, just, you know, almost two months ago, we, we have to point out Devontae Walker. You mm-hmm. had him here at the beginning of the second round. So kind of not too far off of a guy like Xavier Worthy before a guy yep. like Keon Coleman, if we want to break tears there. Um, what has changed for you with Devontae Walker? And uh, this has got to be your guy, right? I think I got a little bit starry eyed seeing him project. This was shortly after he was projected in that first round. And I go, Oh my God, the NFL loves him. Oh my God, they're going to love him. Oh my, like I can, I can put my foot down. I can put my stamp down. He's going to be awesome. And then, the all star the all star pro, um, process started a little bit, and some some uh, parts of his game showed up that weren't really translatable to the NFL, and made me worry about his transition to the NFL a little bit. And you know, I think I got a little bit too starry eyed there, taking him right there. Um, I sh- probably should have waited a little bit longer on that, but uh, I love. I do think that three hundred seven. I actually love the value here. I think you know anywhere from the third down, you know, starting from the third round, I think he's a fine pick. And I think once he gets the draft capital, he'd be viewed maybe even as more uh, somewhere closer to the round. People will be back in on him after we see that draft capital. I think. All right, so Corey, this is your flag plant then, and I'll take Jalen McMillan. Is that? No, I don't. don't, don't say that. This I would say this is also, this is. Go ahead. Sorry. I want to argue with Mike a little bit because we were both at Senior Bowl. We were both watching the same player, and I feel like Devontae Walker was getting open at ease whenever he wanted to, but when he didn't, he struggled. So, like, you know, Mike, what Mike was saying with contested catches, he absolutely struggled. And, and like, but he was getting open so easily. He showed that speed. He showed all that. But he dropped so many balls at the senior bowl. And it was just like, I can't fall in love with you. Like, I was already like up here. And then I'm like, no, I got to break, I got to bring you down because you dropped so many balls. So I, I love the pick here at 307. Honestly, it, I'd probably say it, it would have been my next pick uh, beyond Bucky Irving. I mean, and, and when it's all said and done with draft capital and all that kind of stuff, I wouldn't even have you know an argument over either one. I you know I'd be fine with it. But uh, there was definitely a time and a place where we all kind of thought that Devontae Walker was going to be higher than this, like Corey was uh, did in the last draft. Mike, are you you taking a? Uh... Devontae Walker, you taking Jamison Williams. And then after your answer, you can push us into your, your pick here at 308. Oh, I'll take Jamison. I'll take Jamison. Uh, I think he's got the the poop end of the stick on um, missing that whole first year and then the betting thing. I don't know if I really believe in him bouncing back, but at least I know he has a role in the NFL today. And I I, I do think Devontae Walker ruined enough of his um, perceived value that he's more of a rotational piece uh so but again it's a 307 so like i I can't i can't hate that pick there you go um going over to my pick at the 308 though i took tight end ben sinnott from uh kansas state i actually thought he played pretty fine the um at the senior bowl there was like some he plays fine i think he's a really good tight end he's my tight end three in this class maybe tight end four see how theo johnson gets drafted um but I, I do like Ben Sinnott. He's a good player. I, there's hard, like, my biggest fault against him is his um ability to turn. I, I just, I'm not, 
I don't, I don't think he can really like turn. So it's like his routes aren't always the best, but he's been pretty reliable with a safety blanket for Will Howard. That's now with Ohio state. I, I think he could be like draft capital wise, like these high end three in his class. Yeah. This this has got to be your guy too because then you know the last time we ran he was a new name to me at that time as someone who's not really diving into tight ends before at this point into the season I know with you guys being Devi you're all these guys a little bit longer you took him at the end of the second or like kind of that two twelve so I love to see that you stuck by and you took your guy again here um, Corey uh, do you have any other thoughts on on Benson and and do you agree that he's probably one of the top four guys maybe the end of kind of where we're looking at with tight ends in this class. Yeah, I mean, me and Mike, I mean, we'll say uh, at the Back to Devi, we like to call the team of Back to Devi the Kansas State uh, Wildcats over there. So we kind of like uh, a lot of the things they do and a lot of the a lot of the pieces of their offense. And Ben Sinat was one of the pieces of that offense as well, tested really well at the combine. And again, when you're looking at tight ends, you're just looking for a, a lot of those traits and you're looking for them to be athletic. And, you know, even production doesn't even really correlate like super well to the NFL. We don't need them to be like super productive, but he was. So that helps as well. Um, so I, I really love, uh, I really love this pick here. And I think he's definitely in consideration for like a top four tight end in this class. Okay. I'm going to get this thing up on three Oh nine. I'm going to be doing another boring pick here, but I'm going to go with quarterback and we taking Spencer Rattler. Now this is a name that has hung around seemingly forever. Um, uh, years ago, people remember this guy being projected as the first you know, the next coming quarterback, the first overall pick in the draft, but it's a guy who's had an absolute whirlwind of a career. Uh, John, I don't know if you want to go in and talk a little bit, maybe about the journey of Spencer Rattler, what he does have going for him, what kind of a quarterback he is. Cause we obviously noticed last year, the guy had like no processing time. Guys are raving his face, maybe save himself a little bit. He'll probably end up going day two to a team. He's going to have to really earn his spot at the next level. We know the maturity concerns and all, you know, with him transferring and everything along with that. But what kind of a player has been to Rattler? What would be an ideal spot for him? Uh, if you want to dive in here a little bit on Spencer. Well, I would be, uh, <laughs> I would be, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? I would be remiss if uh, I didn't mention the fact that uh, myself and Herms, uh, if you know Herms on uh, Twitter, we're standing next to Spencer Rattler on the senior bowl field and we were both taller than him. So, you know, that's obviously a slight concern. Uh, we're b not just taller, but bigger than him. And you know, that's never what you want to see in an NFL quarterback. But, you know, just nothing in his game ever stood out. He was one of the highest, if not the highest uh, recruits when, it, you know, like early on and people really thought he was going to be the thing. And he just never was, you know, he has a high interception rate. He has a low a dot or I intended air yards. Kind of like I was talking with Bo Nix earlier on. Um, he doesn't have a big time throw rate. He's just not a quality quarterback. And we kind of saw it in the senior bowl. Like he makes some good throws, but man, he gets in his own head and he just, I feel like if somebody said it and I'm not trying to steal it because I, this is not my, these are not my words, but somebody said like, if you can get him a, uh, if you can get him like a, an actual therapist, it might actually save his career because like he just, he's a head case and you know, like he, he, he needs to be out of his head when he's throwing the ball, when he's, you know, behind the line of scrimmage. And yet he just, he needs that kind of sports therapist or whatever you want to call it. And he unfortunately probably doesn't have it. And uh, yeah, I, I really want nothing to do with them. Once again, it's a quarterback in the end of the third. I can't argue with it. I'm not going to say it's a bad pick, I'm just going to say I would bet against Spencer Rattler hitting when it's all said and done. All right, Mike, you were at the, I don't know if you saw Spencer Rattler as well. I don't know how he stacked up height wise to yourself, but uh, are you sharing kind of the same sentiments here about John with Spencer and, and do, do you, do you think he has a chance? I don't really think he has too much of a chance. I think he'll just be a backup. Uh, he's, he's really late on his throws. Like he makes the correct read, but for some reason, like just waits too long to pull the trigger on the throw. Um, that's his biggest issue. Like that's, I think his number one issue. He's a fine processor kind of stares down his first read. Usually though, I think that's just kind of the system they had though at South Carolina. Like they only have like get, like there's no other people to read even too, honestly. Um, but he wouldn't throw the ball away. And that's, I think a common issue of a lot of quarterbacks coming out of uh, college. They just want to hold on to the ball and wait for the play to develop. Uh, so, like, that's it. I'm not really in on Spencer Rattler. Although, I do want to say, though, the little attitude stuff that was uh, kind of a part of his profile, um, his interviews were great. Like, I thought he was really 
trying to change that narrative, uh, even during the senior bowl, like hyping up his boys, high fiving them, doing little dances and stuff with the guys. Like it, it, he looked like a leader and like one of the guys, which wasn't always how we um like perceived him for the first couple of years there. Yeah, I'm I'm not gonna try to put out information I can't confirm, but that definitely was a narrative early on. Was he one of the boys? He wasn't even considered like he wouldn't even look at his boys. Like at least those were some of the rumbles lock, coming yeah, around. Room and, issue type and, of guy. Yeah. yeah, and you were you were catch he was more concerned a little bit with what was going on after practice, you know. And so hopefully I uh, hopefully he can get those things right and maybe can make his impact at the next level. But John, I know you're not in on Spencer Rattler. Give us the next pick. What's what pick should have been taken there? Well, I forget who took it. I want to say it was Corey that took Jalen McMillan earlier, and he was incorrect because he should have taken Jalen Polk. Or I'm sorry, it was Mike that took him. Uh, but yeah, that, that's my my fault. Um, I, I I tend to do that. I I I yell at the wrong person. But here we are. Uh, I, I'm not saying that I absolutely love Jalen Polk, but you know we we can make the same arguments for Polk that we made for McMillan. You know, Roma Dunze was there. McMillan was there. You know, there's all these question marks and everything, and but yet Polk did a lot more when he touched the ball than McMillan did when he touched the ball. So we can look at like smaller samples and still say that <laughs> there's a lot going on in the chat right now, but uh, we can look at what they did when they actually touched the ball. And we can say that Polk was a much better player once he actually like had the ball, you know, caught the ball, whatever you want to want to say. And so, not only that, but we're seeing much better projected draft capital for Polk. Now, if it, if it changes when it's all said and done, once again, this is not a guarantee. But as of right now, we're seeing much better uh, projected draft capital for Jalen Polk than we are for McMillan. Um, I'm seeing 60 or 59 for Polk, and I'm seeing 84 for uh, McMillan. So, you know, like I'm just, I'm willing to, at this point in the draft, 310 take that shot and say, Hey, it's not just the Romo Dunze show. You know, like we, we got to go ahead and, and get another player in this offense. And, and and yeah, I'm willing to do it now. I'm not really willing to do it when McMillan was taken, especially because I, I feel like Polk is a, a better player. All right, Mike, without talking about McMillan here, well, what, what are your general thoughts on Polk? What makes him a different player and, and how do you see him going at the next level? Um, He's a contested catch specialist. He doesn't really separate. He doesn't really do anything with his footwork. Um, and this is like against like Pac-12 competitions. So you can't separate his Pac-12 DBs. It's not going to happen at the pro level either. It's a very average level athlete. I know me and Corey both comp him to like a Tylen Wallace, but that was a little bit less athletic than Tylen Wallace. If you remember him back in the day, um, who was just like a six foot contested catch specialist. So I don't think Polk has much of a future in the NFL. And I don't, I, I, I'm pretty like confident he won't be drafted day two. I think he's more like an early day three guy, but I do love his ball skills, like excellent hands. I just don't like think his play type fits today's NFL. And that's why he's stuck around such a long time and only really got productive here once McMillan was hurt. So there you go. All right, Corey. Now I do want to say for, for John, we got the two campus to Canton guys here uh, where I'm giving you all these tiebreakers, Corey, and it might not be fair to John, but um Give us your maybe a closing thought here on Polk, and then let's 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 finish this third round. Let's get the three eleven going. Yeah, no, I, do I, it, I trust Corey. I like him, so yeah, you know, <laughs> I'm giving him the, I'm giving him the tiebreaker here. I do think that there's a role for these type of guys at the next level, and I do think the NFL likes them more than the fantasy community likes them because they don't they're like they're not very high volume players for fantasy purposes, and like I, there's a there's a, a path for him to succeed at the NFL level. I just don't think it's going to be super fantasy based. I do agree somewhat with Mike's evaluation where I don't see a lot of separation on tape. I don't see a lot of yak ability from him, but I see a guy who does win above the rim and has very strong hands, has good size, and he does do a lot of things really well. But I mean we weren't even talking about Jalen Polk until Jalen McMillan went down this year. And like even leading up to it for these, all these years as well. Like, so it's hard for me to say that. And, you know, even with the way the offense operated with some of the defenses they played, like I'm a little bit worried about Jalen, Jalen Polk's um, transition to the NFL less so than I am about Jalen McMillan. I think Jalen McMillan is a very plug and play type player. I think Jalen Polk is going to be like a very one dimensional role in the NFL. Awesome. And I will say it just depends on your source where you think these guys are going to land. I don't think six hit 80 and uh, NFL draft 
uh, mock draft database is significantly different, like to be honest. Yeah. So we'll see. I think both these guys have the chance to land on day two. I think both could potentially fall into the beginning of round four. We'll have to go and see where they land and we'll come back and we'll reevaluate a little bit after the draft. But Corey, keep us pushing here. Who is the 311? Yeah, 311. I'm dipping back into the running back well. And for a guy who graded out as a top five running back for me, and that's not saying much in an underwhelming running back class, but that's Mr. Ray Davis or Ramon Davis, depending on how far you've been following him uh, since his days at Temple. But this is another guy who suffered an ACL tear earlier in his career, similar to the way we were talking about Marshawn Lloyd. It's taken a while to come back from it um went to uh started at temple went to vanderbilt kind of had a rebirth of his career there and now took it to kentucky where he really put it all together and i see a guy who has smooth footwork i see a guy who excels as a pass catcher as well and not just a dump off guy a guy who's shown some hands down the field um has been able to run routes uh, past the line of scrimmage um and this is a guy who's just very well rounded all the way around i won't say he's a, a he's a king athlete i won't say he there's like a super elite trait about him but coming here at 311 i think he's a guy who can get into an nfl backfield and if something opens up in front of him some kind of circumstance where there is a, a guy that goes down or a guy who you know gets dinged up a little bit and Ray Davis a chance to show himself a little bit I think this is a guy who could surprise people with how much work he can actually do and how much of a workload he can actually handle so Ray Davis I like him taking a chance here at 311 hopefully he can just stick to a team and, and wait for the opportunity to arise for himself okay uh Mike do you have any, do you have any thoughts here on Ray Davis no no I agree uh I think he's a great change to pace back and like maybe a one B, uh, but also like a guy that like, let's say the, the RB one goes down, which is very, very common in the NFL. Like you'll feel pretty good playing our Ray Davis into your starting lineup. And then if you have a player you're drafting at the three eleven, where you're like that, that's pretty good where you have like an actual opportunity to plug and play. So I, I, I like that. All right. Who you take in here to close out the third. Yeah. I'm taking the project QB that I think is really worth drafting here. Michael Pratt from two lane. I think he has like, I think he's really comparable to Will Levis, except for he's price appropriate. You know, like he's not going in the second round of NFL draft. He's probably going third or fourth round. I don't think he gets to the fifth, but like around there, you know, and I think he's a project. So I, I like Michael Pratt here. His main issues are like touch and like pathing. By pathing, I mean, Sometimes he throws straight line, like velocity balls. And other times he throws like these arcs. So he'll like throw these like high power balls. And it's like, you don't need to throw it that hard. And then vice versa, where like, I need you to more arc it over the DB. And he's just trying to like rifle into a tight window. Um, his mechanics are like robotic. Like he, his mechanics are super clean, almost like too clean. It's like, you can relax a little bit. Like it, we used to harp a lot on mechanics uh probably like last decade and then Patrick Mahomes came around and started doing some sidearm stuff and now there's a bunch of kids doing sidearm stuff in high school and college now so but I do think his mechanics are very clean I just think he's um his he's got like little tweaks to his game I think all the major stuff processing is all there so I am really excited about Michael Pratt as a project QB for an NFL team but I really think he's actually worth like the time and not going to cost you the 111 to the Vikings or whatever JJ McCarthy's going you're not uh you're not enamored by Joe Milton's absolute cannon on one no, throw. He's not only winning everybody Timbo. over. Like I, I always love when we see that. Um sometimes those big throws, you know, it can get Zach Wilson yeah. really propped up. And I, I do love to see it. No one talking about necessarily Joe Milton before one throw, and now he's the sleeper quarterback. Um does anyone else have any thoughts on Michael Pratt here before we get into some honorable mentions? I love the take that he's the Will Levis if he was drafted correctly. I, I honestly love that. There we go. All right, guys. Now, instead of doing an entire fourth round where we don't even have the draft capital, we are just going to go in and give you one to remember, just somebody to keep your eye on here that we didn't get to in the beginning of our draft. I'll kick things off here and go with Isaac Guarendo running back from Louisville. He's going to go day three, right? I don't, I, I'd be surprised if this guy goes day two because he didn't necessarily give us a whole lot to look at before the NFL combine, which is why I don't even have pre-combine ADP data on this player. But he ran extremely fast, one of the most impressive guys, 4-3 time there. Good size on him. Just somebody to keep your eye on. Um, a, you know, a big win, I would say, from us going through and doing this exercise with the Campus of Canton guys two years ago was mentioning Isaiah Pacheco in this exact same segment. Uh, we've got another I name speed to force to talk about. He's older than Pacheco was when we talked to him, so I will just mention that. Um, turns 24 before the two. 
2024 season begins, but he is that size speed combo that in the correct landing spot, I think is just someone to keep your eye on here. Uh, I don't know if anyone has, has watched this guy and if they have anything, maybe a little bit more about his place. I'll add in here. Yeah, I actually watched him the other day. Um, and I, I hate to say this, but I actually think he has a lot of Pacheco in him. Uh, so he runs like a thousand miles per hour. Like he is, he's all gas, no vision. He's just pinballing around. He doesn't know where he's going. And then somehow he'll find an open space and then like punish a defense with speed. But like, it's no, it's zero finesse. It's just zero finesse. It's just all just chaotic and speed. So, um, and like you said, I think he's a day three guy. He's good. He, I, Gave him a UDFA grade before this, after this. I'm like, yeah, he's probably like a six rounder. But if this guy lands in like, again, ideal spot with opportunity, I'm probably smashing this guy in like the early third. And I, and I think he'll probably win the opportunity. And if you're not a competitor, that's a quick flip for a quick buck. You know, you don't hold on to those Elijah Mitchells. You know what I'm saying? Like flip those guys real quick. Yeah, not everyone's going to keep going like Isaiah Pacheco, right? Yeah, Even though, like, that year, uh, we had a lot of people. It's where a lot of people found JWB was off of that, getting their Isaiah Pacheco's, kind of just that guy to auto in the early, mid-fourth round who just at least has something you can hang your hat on here. It's the size and the speed, right? Just get into a team that is just going to hand him the ball block for him and say, just run like a maniac. Yeah. Just put your head down, pop up, excited, even though you just got absolutely rocked. I mean, that's what we loved about Isaiah Pacheco. And on paper, I love seeing another guy like that. Someone to keep your eye on. I agree with you. We'll see where he lands. If there's any opportunity, which was the best part about Isaiah Pacheco to go with the side and speed was that he had a very clear opportunity uh, on a team that needed exactly what he had. So we'll see if that happens here for Garendo. Somebody definitely keep your eye on. Um, John, I'm going to push it on to you. Who is someone you think that people should be keeping their eye on? Honestly, I don't pay that much attention to tight ends in the Debbie realm because generally speaking, like they're just bad bets. Uh, they're bad bets as recruits. They're bad bets as players. And then, you know, they, like, you know, I think Corey touched on it earlier. Like production doesn't necessarily mean that they're going to be amazing in the NFL. And so I don't truly focus on it, but we went to the senior bowl and it was, oh, Theo Johnson just made another catch. Theo Johnson just made another catch. Theo Johnson made a catch and it was like, oh my God, okay, who's this Theo Johnson guy? Oh, he went to Penn State. He's probably going to run pretty damn quick. And he goes out and he runs a four, five, seven, 40 at six foot six, 259 pounds. And I'm like, okay, you know, like he's just gradually growing. And I honestly, I'm not, I'm not even going to lie. I, I'm a Debbie analyst. I'm a rookie analyst. I, People pay for my ranks. I have still not even put together my tight end ranks because I care that little about the tight end position until the combine actually happens and everything. But I will put it together soon. I wouldn't doubt if Theo Johnson was my tight end too when it's all said and done. I'm not saying he is. I'm just saying I wouldn't doubt that he was my tight end, tight end too when it's all said and done. And especially with draft capital and all that kind of stuff. Um, he's He's basically been a riser throughout this entire thing. And like, I've been trying to figure out for a month now, who was the winner of the senior bowl. And I'm now going back to it after the combine and thinking it might've been Theo Johnson. There you go. Now you did say that you don't love the Raz, the relative athletics score. So I'm going to throw it to you, Corey on this, and then you can transition into your one to remember um, with exactly everything John was saying the athleticism seems to be the reason a lot of these tight ends are getting drafted, you know, on day two. It seems really common. I feel like in the last few years, there's been more tight ends than I've expected just going in day two, whether they stink at football or not, uh, whether they have not all of them have this Sam Laporta level impact, right? You see other guys go went day two last year. I mean, Schoomaker, uh, you know, is, is a guy I'll throw out there who went day two as well and gave us pretty much nothing. But how much weight do you put into Raz? And did somebody like Theo Johnson really stand out to you because of it? Raz exactly. I mean, me and Mike have talked about it a little bit that I don't I don't follow Raz that much because like people are opting out of so much testing nowadays and like who you're comparing it to in the background, like have did they complete their tests all back in the day? But you still get a Raz score even if you miss out on like three or four tests or something like that. So Raz in general, I don't exactly follow too much, but just I just want to see athleticism at the tight end position. And he definitely sparks it. You want to see size, you want to see him carrying that size really well. And we're talking about six six, two hundred and sixty pounds and athleticism like this that's all the tickets i need to really be able to be hit on a tight end like there's not much analysis more than you need more than that i mean you want to see production but even some of the most productive tight ends 
at the college level haven't really gone to the NFL and, and produced the way they have in the NFL at the uh, at the college level. So I'm with him here. You know, this Theo Johnson I've been following for a long time, Canadian born prospect as well. Like he's he, he's got a lot of tools working in his, in his favor right now. Um, and I, I, he could be a very surprising like top three tight end in this class. There you go. And sorry to see your thunder before you go into your winner. Remember, I do want to say because a lot of our patrons who follow every single year when it comes to these late fours, we love the running backs, you know, like the Grenda that we mentioned. The other players I personally like, which are my favorite players to put on my taxi, are these tight ends. The athletic mm-hmm. tight ends, I'll throw darts. If, I, if I'm collecting, let's say you got rid of a, a Zacher last year for two fours, and now I've got two fours. I love come in. I'll take my guy Sinnott. I will take a Theo Johnson. Other guys like Jaime Bell. I'm cool with taking just these types of guys. Play, take two of them, put them in my taxi because with the quarterbacks, if a quarterback gets hurt or a running back gets hurt, well, you you either want to trade these players to someone who's going to need them or you're putting them into your lineup, which means now you're burning that spot in your taxi squad for people who don't play with taxi squad. Sometimes people do anywhere from two to six players where you get to roster them, but they can't move off of that little section until the next year. And if they do, you can't replace them. So it's kind of like a little reserve spot for your roster. And I, I just like doing with tight ends because even if a tight end shows a little bit in that rookie year, I'm not taking them off. I'm, I'm going to hope that I have someone else I can stream week to week. You know, I can plug in a Juwan Johnson, a Gerald Everett. I don't need to take my Chega Conquo off because he, he might have one good week as a rookie. Like, I don't necessarily need to do that. So I have a lot of these guys who broke out, uh, you know, maybe like a Greg Dulcich or a, a Daniel Bellinger, their rookie years, who had some value in the trade market after that rookie year, at least more so than where you drafted them. I didn't have to take them off my taxi. So I, I do like the shout out with Theo Johnson. I like seeing the athleticism is all I need to kind of auto click them if he's there at the end of my fourth round. Or a lot of these guys don't get drafted. I just go and pick up all the t- the the more athletic tight ends that don't get drafted. I pick them up right after. That was Chiga Conquo in his class just to kind of add to it. So, uh, But that being said, Corey, who is your one to watch? No, I wouldn't necessarily say this is like a flag plant for me or anything, but I do think Xavier Leggett from South Carolina is is pretty interesting. A guy that, you know, really broke out this year, fifth year player though. And then a lot of people want to point to a lot of context behind here. I don't know how much weight I put on all of it. I mean, we're talking about a guy who never suffered a major injury throughout his high school career or throughout his college career. Um, some people want to say because he played quarterback in high school, but I mean, he was a wide receiver all of his high school career, just played quarterback that final season because they needed it. But he did come in fairly raw. He was very underweight as well. He was like under 90 pounds so he had to add weight he had to learn he had to adjust to a higher competition level he only played like two a football in high school as well so there was a big adjustment period there and then a lot of people want to point to he suffered with a lot of loss in his life he lost like both his parents in a short amount of time he suffered in a motorcycle accident so there is a lot of context there how much weight you want to put on a lot of that context is up to you but it is a fifth year profile that a lot of analytics people will hate and there's not a lot of production there and there's not a lot of excuse for it so we're talking about a guy just broke out in his final year but so many traits there to be uh, excited about, right? We're talking about a, fo- a sub four, four second, 40, like four, three, nine, I believe it was a 1.454 split as well. A 10 yard split, which is a very good number, 40 inch vert, uh, 10 foot, six inch broad. So, I mean, we're talking about a, a, one of the, another one of these guys where it's the traits you want to bet on. And I mean, if you're paying attention to where he's going in like mock drafts or whatever, he looks like he could be like a day two pick, right? A lot of people are loving that. Just a lot of people are starting to think this is that Denzel Mims. This is that Taekwon Thornton type of guy uh, that um, that's going to bust at the next level. And there isn't a a lot of nuance in in the parts of his game that he that he does you know there's not a lot of nuance in his route running he's winning with that pure speed he's winning with that athleticism so he's going to have a, a transition level to the to to the nfl that that's going to take a little bit of time i think at least more than some people are expecting watching all those big play those big play highlights that he had in south carolina this year so i like him as a guy taking late in your draft and just seeing what happens but as a second round pick i will just say i'm more apprehensive about that which is where i see him going more often than not in rookie drafts yeah, his ADP was 212 for anyone in context, and he made it to what would yeah. have been our early fourth round. Now, with a player like this, you know, played through the senior bowl, there was conversation there, he impressed at the combine. Uh, I am seeing right with you these mock drafts and going day two pretty regular. I'm not going to say that he is this case when I make this comparison because he's a very, very different player. But I will say when a guy is just routinely mocked, sometimes as high as the second round, and then they go on day two, even in the second round, you can't ignore Tank Dell was a guy a year yep. ago where I saw every single mock draft. He wasn't even a guy who was really on my radar because of his size, really. But then you look at his production file and it was absolutely bonkers. But it's like, well, the size, right? I mean, I'm going to pay attention. And then the, the combine happens. Kind of killed him. Just different, different to Jet, of course. But 
he stayed there in the mock drafts. And I kind of look past the player because of the combine. He didn't have the blitzing speed with his size. And I overlooked the fact that he had been respected by the league for a while. And maybe this is a guy like a Roman or who knows. But if you see these guys just in there in the mocks, but the fantasy community or your Twitter or your Reddit sphere or your discords don't love this player, don't sleep on him. Especially if you get to this fourth round pick, you can do a lot worse than a guy. Like if Lejet goes day two and you're in the fourth round, I mean, I don't have to love the player to yeah. take the fly. It's, it's you, very you won't low. get him in the fourth if he goes that high. You won't be getting him in the fourth. I well, I mean, yeah. Tank Dell, Tank Dell yeah. was going late third, early fourth round. That's despite, true, actually. Yeah. Despite getting the draft capital because people had their priors. So I'm not saying Lejet's that guy, but if yeah. anyone in this class in your inner circle has their priors and it sticks to them, um, maybe we, we always joke Zig when they zag, but it, it's just – you know, something I did want to point out, but wrap us out here, Mike, who, who's the last guy here that we should keep our eye on. My last pick here is uh, Dylan Lowby running back from New Hampshire. Uh, he went to the senior bowl. I don't really, I don't, I don't ever really promote the FCS running backs. A few, sometimes they pop off talking about um, Austin Eckler was a good guy. James Robinson was for his injury. Um, but he looked like probably the best pass catcher in this NFL draft class to me, as far as running backs goes. There's not too many guys you can say can like run routes. Like you look at the pros and you're like, seems he can run a route. Probably Gibbs, Eckler used to. I don't think he can anymore. But like that's really it. Otherwise, I think mostly pass catching is just checking the box. I think Lauby might be able to actually run routes. Um, so he offers like a PPR side to it. Again, this is like the fourth round. So, um, and I was mentioning earlier uh, that. RB ones get hurt all the time. I haven't redone this study. I just keep referencing because I just assume it stays the same. But like two, three years ago, whenever I did this, out of the top 24 running backs for fantasy, only um, two of them played all like their entire season. So at some point in time, they were hurt and their backup played for like at least one game. Uh, and during that season, it was like the, the King Derrick Henry, who you expect to play every single game. And then it was uh, the Naeem Hines year. That he went like that he went off. I was like, it yeah, outside of that, everyone always gets hurt. So I always like picking running backs late to usually guys that land into good opportunities or don't have much roles in front of them. But I think Lobby actually has a passing skill set to get him on the field day one. Don't know if he does much more than that, maybe in some special team stuff, but um he's gonna stick around the pros, I think, for a little bit. So there you go. I will say, I mean, nearly identical 40 time there to your guy, uh, Bucky Irving, John. So I, I, I know people, I, I had heard a lot of discourse that compared the, the at least the skill set there. I mean, of course, a lot of it's New Hampshire. Everything's a grain of salt. Um, but in terms of maybe if you want just a discount, maybe if, I mean, Bucky now has got his own discount, but if you wanted a discount shot at one of these classes where maybe it's role player backs, I mean, the fourth round, you can do a lot worse. John, do you have any thoughts on this player uh, before we get out of here? Not really. I don't have them that uh, far behind another player that I'll mention, but I if I'm making that like small school bet, I'm going to do it on Kimani Vidal. Or Ka Kimani Vidal, because he actually corrected me at the Senior Bowl on his name. Or he didn't really correct me, but I said Kimani Vidal, and then when he actually said it for the promo for the Debbie Devotional, he said, hey, this is Kimani Vidal, and I was like, ah, I feel like an asshole. So I, <laughs> um, I only have him a few spots ahead, but he has the BMI over uh, Lob, uh, 32 compared to a 29. He has the reception game, and now... Uh, Lob has that reception game. Like, I'm not going to lie. Like, he definitely is a receiving back. So, I'm not trying to take that away. But uh, Vidal also has that. But he has the, the speed score. He has the burst score. He has the size. He's the only thing about Vidal that I can really say is that he was a small school player and he's five foot eight. Um, if it wasn't for that, like, I feel like we would be like all over Vidal. But I kind of just want to draft him in all of my fifth rounds. Like, every single fifth round this one have all the vidal i also kind of want to uh adopt him because i interviewed him and he's amazing and i i love him to death there you go four four six respectable time there um and shout out everyone who does have fifth rounds in their rookie drafts love that please if your league is not look to extend it past i think 25 to 28 roster spots is kind of the bare minimum i like if you can push 30 plus so that way you can take a bet on some of these guys a little later such as vidal i would i would uh encourage you to do so